Hi students, with permission from Scholastic, we're going to be reading chapter six from the City of Ember today. As promised, we have already had one guest reader, Mrs. Bernacki, and today we actually have my husband, uh, Mr. Becerra, who's going to be guest reading chapter six for us. Um, the reading strategy that we are encouraging you to use for this chapter is to divide a, just a sheet of paper, it could be a notebook paper, computer paper, whatever, into four boxes and draw a comic or a storyboard um, as you go along of what is happening in the chapter. Um, hopefully you realize that the book is starting to get really interesting and the plot is starting to pick up and I think you'll be interested to see what happens in this chapter. Um, the, Chapter title alone is interesting. So please enjoy Mr. Becerra reading chapter six. Go ahead. I'm chewing, reading from my reading chair. First time. Uh, chapter six, the box in the closet. It was strange how people didn't talk much about the blackout. Power failures usually arouse lively discussion with clumps of people collecting on corners and saying to each other, where were you when it happened? And what's the matter with the electricians? We should kick them out and get new ones. And that sort of thing, this time, it was just the opposite. When Lena went to work the next morning, the street was oddly silent. People walked quickly, their eyes on the ground. Those who did stop to talk spoke in low voices, then hurried on their way. That day, Lena carried the same message 12 times. All the messengers were carrying it. It was simply this, being passed from one person to another. Seven minutes. The power, the power failure had been more than twice as long as any other so far. Fear had settled over the city. Lena felt it like a cold chill. She understood now that Dune had been speaking the truth on assignment day. Ember was in grave danger. The next day, a notice appeared on the city kiosk. Town meeting. All citizens are requested to assemble in Harkin Square at 6 p.m. tomorrow to receive important information. Mayor Lamander Cole. What kind of important information, Lena wondered. Good news or bad? She was impatient to hear it. The next day, people streamed into Harkin Square from all four directions, crowding together to close that each person hardly had room to move. Children sat on the shoulders of fathers. Short people tried to push towards the front. Lena spotted Lizzie and called a greeting to her. She saw Vindy Chance, two whom had brought her little brother. Lena had decided to leave Poppy at home with Granny. There was too much danger of losing her in the crowd like this. The town clock, be the town clock began to strike. Six vibration bongs rang out and the murmur of anticipation swept through the crowd. People stood on tiptoes, craning, craning to see. The doctor of the gathering hall opened and the mayor came out, flanked by two guards. One of the guards handed the mayor a megaphone and the mayor began to speak. His voice came through the megaphone, both blurry and crackly. People of Ember, he said. He waited. The crowd fell silent, straining to hear. People of Ember, the mayor said again. He looked from side to side, the light glinting off his bald head. Our city has experienced some slight difficulty. Times like this required Gresh Prinshid Frushnall. What did he say? People whispered urgently. What did he say? I couldn't hear him. Slight difficulties, someone said, requires great patience from all of us. But I stand here to the mayor, the mayor went on, to reassure you, difficult times will pass. We are magnificent. What? Came the sharp whisper. What did he say? Those near the front passed word back, making every effort. They said, every effort? Louder, someone shouted. The mayor's voice blared through the megaphone. Louder, but even less clear. Worse pusher shooting, he said. Pink, Russian pink, no Russian pink. We can't hear you, someone yelled. Lena felt a string around her. A muttering someone pushed against her back, forcing her forward. He said, we mustn't panic. 
someone said. He said, panic in the worst possible thing. No reason to panic, he said. On the steps of Gathering Hall, the two guards moved a little closer to the mayor. He raised the megaphone and spoke again. Solutions, he bellowed. Arbenfound solutions, the people in the front called to the people in the back. Solutions are being found, he said. What solutions, called a woman standing near Lena. People elsewhere in the crowd echoed what the woman had said. What solutions? What solutions, they cried, became a chorus louder and louder. Again, Lena felt a pressure from being from behind as people moved forward towards the gathering hall. Jostling arms poked her, bulky bodies bumped her and crushed her. Her heart began to pound. I have to get out of here, she shouted. She started ducking beneath arms and darting into whatever space she could find, making her way towards the rear of the crowd. Noise was rising everywhere. The mayor's voice kept coming in blasts of incomprehensible sound, and the people in the crowd were either shouting angrily or yelping in fear of being squashed. Someone stepped on Lena's foot, and her scarf was half yanked off. For a few seconds, she was afraid of what was going to, if she was going to be trampled. But at last, she struggled free and ran up onto the steps of the school. From there, she saw the two guards were hustling the mayor back through the door of Gathering Hall. The crowd roared and a few people started hurling whatever they could find, pebbles, garbage, crumpled paper, even their own hats. At the other side of the square, June and his father battled their way down Gilly Street Move fast, his father said. We don't want to be caught up in this crowd. They crossed Broad Street and took the long way home through the narrow lanes behind the school. Father, said Dune as he hurried along, the mayor is a fool, don't you think? For a moment, his father didn't answer. Then he said, he's in a tough spot, son. What would you have him do? Not lie, at least, Dune said. If he really was a solution, he should have told us. He shouldn't pretend he has a solution when he doesn't. Dune's father smiled. What would be a good start, he agreed. It makes me so angry the way he talks to us, said Dune. Dune's father put a hand on Dune's back and steered him towards the corner. A great many things make you angry lately, he said. For good reason, said Dune. Maybe... The trouble with anger is it gets a hold of you, and then you aren't the master of yourself anymore. Anger is. Dune walked on silently. Inwardly, he groaned. He knew what his father was going to say, and he didn't feel like hearing it. And then anger is the boss you get. I know, said Dune. Unintended consequences. That's right, like hitting your father in the ear with a shoe heel. I didn't mean to. That's exactly my point. They walked on down Pibb Street. Dune shoved his hand into his pockets of his jacket and scowled at the sidewalk. Father doesn't have, do, father doesn't even have a temper, he thought. He's as mild as a glass of water. He can't possibly understand. Lena was running. She'd already dismissed the mayor's speech from her mind. She sped by the people on Otterwell Street, going back to the open, they're going back to open their stores and overheard snatching of conversations as she passed. Expects us to believe, said one voice. He's just trying to keep us quiet, said another. Heading for disaster, said a third. All the voices shook with anger and fear. Lena didn't want to think about it. Her feet slapped the stones of the street. Her hair flew out from behind her. She would go home. She would make hot potato soup for the three of them and then she would take out her new pencils and draw. She climbed the stairs next to the yarn shop, two at a time, burst through the door of the apartment. Something was on the floor just in front of her feet, and she tripped and fell down hard on her hands and knees and stared. By the open closet door was a great pile of coats and boots and bags and boxes. Their contents all spilled out and tangled up. A thumping and rattling came inside the closet. Granny? More thumps. Granny's head poked around the edge of the closet door. I should have looked in here a long time ago, she said. 
This is where it would be, of course. She should see what's in here. Lena gazed around this incredible mess into the closet. Had been packed the chunks of decades, jammed into cardboard boxes, stuffed into old pillowcases and laundry bags, and headed up in the pile so dense that you couldn't pull one thing out without pulling all the rest with it. The shelves above the coat rack was just as crammed as the space below, mostly with old clothes, and there were a few of moth holes and eaten away by mildew. When she was younger, Lena had tried exploring in this closet, but she never got far. She'd pull out an old scarf that would fall into pieces in her hands and open a box that proved to be full of bent carpet tacks. Soon she would shove everything back and give up. But Granny was really doing the job right. She grunted and panted as she rushed free the closets packed in stuff and tossed it behind her. It was clear that she was having fun as Lena watched a bag of rags come tumbling out the door, and then an old brown shoe with no laces. Granny, said Lena, suddenly uneasy. Where's the baby? Oh, she's here, came Granny's voice from the depths of the closet. She's been helping me. Lena got up from the floor, looked around. She soon spotted Poppy. She was sitting behind the couch in the midst of the clutter. In front of her was a small box of something dark and shiny. It was hinged lid and the lid open, hanging backwards. Poppy said, Lena, let me see that. She stood down. And there was some sort of mechanism on the edge of the lid. It kind of locked, Lena thought. The box was beautifully made, but it had been damaged. There were dents and scratches in its hard, smooth surface. It looked as it had been a container of something, a container of something valuable, but the box was empty now. Lena picked it up and felt around in it to be sure. There was nothing inside at all. Was there something in this box, Poppy? Did you find something in here? But Poppy only chortled happily. She was chewing on some crumbled paper. She had a paper in her hand too, and was tearing it, shreds of paper strewn around her. Lena picked it up. It was covered with small, perfect printing. Dun, dun, dun.